Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday keynote luncheon. I'm Jody Miller. I want to welcome everyone to Minnesota. Thank you so much for being here. We're so excited to have all of you on this beautiful, warm, sunny day in St. Paul, Minnesota. I want to give a couple of tips for keeping warm. One is, it's mind over matter. Wear, wear a short sleeve shirt and just embrace it. Another one is drink lots of coffee. And another one is just keep moving. Don't sit still for too long. Thanks everybody for being here. Um, we have a couple of awards to present while you're enjoying your lunch. You don't need to stop eating. First, we'd like to present the Jane E. Lawton Commemorative Award. The Jane E. Lawton Award is presented annually to an elected official to recognize his or her years of extraordinary service on behalf of local government and communities throughout the United States. It was created in memory of the Honorable Jane E. Lawton, who served as mayor of Chevy Chase, Maryland, delegate to the Maryland State House, and president of NATOA. Jane was a close friend of many of us. Um, she was a mentor to me and much beloved, so this is a very honored award. And I'm going to uh, let Ken present the award because he's a, he's a good friend of this year's recipient. Good afternoon. Um, this year's Jane E. Lawton Commemorative Award is being presented to Mayor Brian Waller of Piscataway, New Jersey. Um, unfortunately, he couldn't be here today because one of the many things he does is he serves um, on a variety of committees with the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and he had a conflict. But um, I want to tell you a little bit about um, Mayor Waller and uh, his community and what he's done uh, for all of us in the local government community with his advocacy. Um, I know we have some Jersey people here. That's my home state, by the way, for those of you who think I'm just from Colorado. Jersey people, raise your hand. All right, okay. <laughs> So Piscataway is a city of about 56,000 people, and Brian Waller was elected mayor in 2000, and he's been re-elected three times since then. Um, interesting fun fact, Natoa's New Jersey chapter, JAG, the Jersey Access Group, was actually started in Piscataway, New Jersey in 1999. So we have a Natoa connection to Mayor Waller and his community. Um, he serves on the U.S. Conference of Mayors Transportation and Communications uh, Committee, which is how I first met him when I was serving as mayor of Arvada, Colorado. We worked together on that committee um, uh, a number of years ago. He also serves as the chair of the Telecom Committee and the Utilities Task Force for the New Jersey State League of Municipalities. Uh, he's the third vice president of the New Jersey League, so in a few years, uh, if we can keep him out of trouble, he'll be the ch uh, president of the New Jersey League. And uh, this November, I'm going to have the privilege of uh, speaking at the New Jersey League's conference, so I'm hoping that uh, we can represent this award to Mayor Waller at that time. I will tell you this, he is a tireless supporter for PEG, for local control, for municipal broadband. Um, he, yes, go ahead and clap for that. He's, um, And he understands, and now I, I would say today in 2014, most mayors get this, but Brian understood this 10 years ago, how important it is to have the state-of-the-art broadband uh, networks in our communities, how important that is for the future of our communities, and he's been a tireless advocate for it. Just one quick story uh, about him, because this will tell you a little bit about the guy. In 2012, he got into a little tiff with um, the mayor of New Jersey, or the governor of New Jersey, a guy you may have read about in the news uh, periodically. Um, it didn't involve closing a bridge, but there had been a dispute between local governments in New Jersey and the state over uh, who was to receive some tax receipts for energy uh, taxes. And uh, the governor was coming into Piscataway, and uh, the mayor made sure there were signs, those electronic signs, 
um, at the entrance to the city that said, welcome governor, please re return our 3.4 million in energy money. <laughs> and um, in response to that, um, Chris Christie called Brian Waller a guy with a big mouth on a, just about everything but taxes. And um, it just seems to me that if you get criticized by Chris Christie, um, you're a good guy in my book. So um, I look forward to giving this to uh, Brian uh, in person. And uh, let's give him a big round of applause for all that he's done for the local government community. I'm really sorry, before we do our next award, I should have introduced Ken. I always assume that everyone knows Ken Fellman, but he is uh, one of our past presidents of the NATOA board and a life member and a representative on the FCC IAC and continues to work very hard for NATOA. Our next award is a new award this year. and. The NATOA board created this new award called the Spirit Award. We have the great pleasure of presenting this inaugural award created to recognize an industry professional or company that has demonstrated a record of working with local governments in a spirit of cooperation on communications issues of mutual interest. And we really want to recognize and continue to build NATOA as an organization that does work with industry and that develops best practices and works in a cooperative manner. And we do appreciate our industry friends who do work well with us. And with that, I'd like to, again, let Ken actually present the award because he has some great working relationship with this year's winner. Um, thank you, uh, Jody. Uh, so this is really, it, it's nice to present the inaugural Spirit Award to Sheila Willard, Comcast Senior Vice President for Local Media Development. This is the photo op portion of our show, and then I'll say a few words. All right, Perkins. Okay. What, hashtag Natoa 2014, right? That's where these photos need to go. Um, Sheila has no idea what I'm going to say. Um, and I love to get people from Comcast nervous. It's just something I, I enjoy doing. Um, in all seriousness, um, I, I really feel blessed um, that in the work that I've done for local governments, I've gotten to know a lot of people in the industry. Uh, there are some that um, haven't gotten along with. Uh, there are others that, while we haven't always agreed on uh, substantive issues, we've maintained a positive working relationship and actually developed uh, both professional and personal friendships. And uh, there is no one on the industry side of things that I have enjoyed working more with and have it, it come up with some really productive, positive outcomes than Sheila Willard. Um, and one of the reasons is, uh, because I'm not, I don't think I'm alone in, in saying that about her, um, she has always, more than anyone else I've ever worked with on the industry side, understood the importance of local government's involvement in the communications that we have with our citizens, with our communities, and she has worked very, very hard in an industry where she was often and is often in the minority among some of her colleagues to press the importance of industry working with local governments to help us jointly figure out new and better ways to get appropriate information to our citizens. Um, she. Um, she went from being a government affairs person for many, many, many years to uh, after the merger with um, NBC Universal. I hear it's a it's a pretty big company. I don't. There's um, that she she now is um, she went from government affairs basically to becoming a technology geek, 
and, and that was um, a huge challenge for her. But she has figured out um, and has promoted some incredibly exciting uh, programs and apps and ways that local governments can get information out to, um, to our community members. And she's told me a little bit about what's coming down the pike, and it's really exciting, and we're going to see that um, probably in the not too distant future. Uh, and anything we can do to work together uh, to promote these issues, we ought to be doing. And we don't have a better ally anywhere in the industry um, than Sheila. That doesn't mean we're always going to agree on things. That doesn't mean when she tells me about the great stuff she's working on, and I say, how quickly can you get that to Colorado, that it actually gets there the next day. I'm still bugging her about that. but. Um, but really, we are lucky to have her doing what she's doing, and we look forward to a long time uh, of positive working relationship, and we're so pleased to award you with this honor and um, look forward to continuing to working with you. You get the mic. I first of all would like to thank Natoa and also Ken. Ken doesn't know it, but I actually got my first experience meeting the Dalai Lama um, through Ken. And it was a something called Peace Jam, was it? Peace Jam. And it was truly, truly amazing. And thanks to Ken, I went on to do another show um, with the Dalai Lama. And so Ken, thank you very much for that. But really, thank you, Natoa, for this wonderful award. And it's not just about the award. I have been hanging around Otoa circles since around 92 ACT, I think, or even before. Anyone remember Palm Beach? My first attempt at the Macarena? Oh, please, I hope no one's here. Anyhow, so we've had a lot of working time together. And I've been on various committees, subcommittees, inside, outside of Natoa. And I really have to tell you all that I have learned so much from you. You have taught me, and yes, as Ken pointed out, sometimes we do have disagreed, but you've taught me the importance of local, importance of what it means to city, what telecom means to city. And I have taken your information and incorporated to the best of my ability in the work I do. And matter of fact, Ken did point out that I took advantage of leaving government affairs during the NBCU deal because I have been obsessed with local for, very, for many, many years. And the first prototype to what I am doing now was actually created with NATOA. It was San Francisco. Byron West was your president. I don't remember what we had for lunch. But she brought in a bunch of people from Natoa, and we started talking about local product. And you know what could we do? Ultimately, what we met about that luncheon um, became Metro Beat in Denver, which I'm still quite proud of, because it was a very, very sweet product, had a nice online component. But it became the prototype for what I'm doing now. And it's because of Natoa. Um, and a lot of your members. So I really, really want to thank you. Thank again Ken, Ken and Jody for, and Steve and everyone else from Natoa for providing me this award. And I really do look forward to many years working with you. Thank you. And now we're just going to have a short presentation by Laura Breeden from NTIA. She's going to come up here and give you a brief report, report on that agency's new Muni Broadband Initiative. So Laura. Hello, everyone. It's been um, incredibly gratifying to be here because I've heard so many great stories about BTOP projects and what's going on now that most of those BTOP dollars are spent. Um, I know it was a lot of hard work on your part, not the least because of the forms that we made you fill out. So I'm going to apologize right now for those forms. Um, if we had known back in the summer of 2009 what we know now, we would have made those forms a lot simpler. However, 
And is there anything I can do uh, to like not have the microphone? Don't breathe into it. Okay. <clears throat> I don't think I can get through this without breathing, but I'll back off. Um, so one of the things that we know because of the reporting that you did as part of your project uh, is that BTOP has created uh, over 100,000 miles of new broadband infrastructure. And really the applause is for all of you because um, you and the other BTOP grantees are the ones who made this work. Our public computing center and broadband adoption programs, and this is the part of BTOP that I worked on. I, I, was the, I am the program manager for those grants. That's a $450 million portfolio. How many had um, either a public computer center or a broadband adoption program grant that you were involved with? Okay, so quite a few people here. We provided, through you, <clears throat> 20 million hours of training to over four million people. And most of these people, <clears throat> I remember in the early parts of the program we heard many times that people were um, much less knowledgeable about computers than the grantees had expected when they wrote their grants. So they were dealing with people who had never touched a computer, who had never used a keyboard, <clears throat> excuse me, or a mouse. Um, and as a result of the efforts of the grantees, um, over 650,000 new broadband households uh, exist in our country, and the overwhelming majority of those are in low-income and disadvantaged areas. So we consider the program to have been a great success, and um, it really is a testament to the work that happened in the field. So I want to just give you a little preview of what's going to happen next, because uh, we still have staff on board and we still have funding and we are pivoting to um, work with you in a new way. Uh, and I want to issue an invitation to you to help us do that. In addition to the, the infrastructure that BTOP created in terms of computer centers and um, networks, uh, fiber networks, there's a huge um, human infrastructure out there now. There's a lot of new knowledge, a lot of new capacity, a lot of new networks of people who have been working together on these projects. Um, and we want to help support that capacity so that that human infrastructure, as well as the physical infrastructure, keeps on giving. And in order to do that, we are going to continue um, using our Broadband USA uh, name um, and work with you um, to provide technical assistance, um, to help people find other people to work with, to have convenings both in DC, but also probably more importantly um, in uh, states and regions around the country as we did in Minnesota just a few weeks ago. We also wanna help be a channel to federal agencies so that um, we can help you uh, eliminate or reduce some of those barriers that the federal government sometimes unwittingly imposes on the um, creation of new programs and new networks. So in healthcare, in veteran services, in housing, in education. Broadband is critical to all of those endeavors at the federal level and we want to be able to work with you to overcome some of those barriers. We're also reaching out to the philanthropic community and to industry to help raise the profile of these issues there. And so I want to invite you to um, give us your feedback, give us your ideas, invite us to your convenings, tell us what you'd like us to do in Washington so that the federal government can be more effective and you can be more effective. My email address is lbreeden at ntia.doc.gov, and I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Tony. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I just want you all to turn around and see how full this room is today. 
Look, look how many people we have here at our luncheon. So, you know, Natoa is here. Natoa is strong and getting better every day. So thanks to all of you for coming. Our keynote speaker today is Marcus Sachs, and he is Verizon's Vice President for National Security Policy and serves on the Executive Committee of the U.S. Communications Sector Coordinating Council. And that's all I'm going to say because you have his whole biography in your app, so you can take a look at that. And I'm not going to take time away from uh, Marcus's time here to, to go into detail, but I just want to say one thing. Marcus gave the similar pr presentation at our cybersecurity workshop earlier this year in Washington, D.C. And it was almost unanimous by everyone there that it was probably one of the best presentations they had ever seen. So now that I put all the pressure back on Marcus, I want to go ahead and introduce him. He's going to be talking about cybersecurity, and believe me, this is going to be a talk you want to listen to. So, Marcus. So it's hard when, when the act you have to follow is yourself. That doesn't happen very often, but <laughs> thank you. And since everybody's talking about where they're from, I'm a Florida boy. So coming to Minneapolis this time of year, and go ahead and throw my slides up if you, uh, if you can, or do I need to just, I'll wait for you, there we go. There we go, outstanding. This time of year is an awesome time to visit this part of the country if you're a Florida boy. I have been to conferences and meetings here in January and February, and when I do come here, I am grateful for everything I took for granted growing up in Florida, <laughs> and because I don't know how you guys do it. <laughs> But I show up at the airport, a cab takes me where I need to go and back to the airport, and I'm just grateful to get back on the plane. But anyway, I'm here to talk about cyber, and I've got about 45 minutes. Hopefully I won't um, interrupt your lunch too much or give you too much indigestion, but we'll certainly give you a few things to think about. Before I get started on, on cyber specifically, when I did this talk uh, several months ago, one of the re requests was to talk about how the state, local area, because I work at a federal level at Verizon, how does this stuff all fit into the big picture, the big ecosystem picture? Well, a few years ago, Department of Homeland Security, I guess we've got a, a condition here where the projector is um, cutting off the letters on the left. So I know we can't climb up here and adjust the projector. So just use your imagination for what's over there on the left. That's just, the, or one of you guys has a big stick and want to tap the projector, but I'm not going to make you do that. Don't worry about that. So in my world at Verizon, I work with Homeland Security for strategic policy. I also work with um, the White House, Defense Department, Department of Commerce, NIST, and many others. And a couple of years back, DHS published this statement about what the cyber ecosystem is. You can see it encompasses all of us. It's not just the private sector. It's not just you as an individual. It's not just companies that get breached like Target and Home Depot. It's also local government, state governments, federal, international, pretty much everybody on the planet now is part of this cyber ecosystem. So all of us have a role. This is nothing that we can just transfer off to, to some group or some organization and say it's your responsibility. It really is everybody. In case you want to read more about it, there is a publication, a white paper that DHS put out a few years ago that talks about the ecosystem it's beginning to get a little aged because technology continues to change, but it's an interesting um, uh, point of view. So let me get started about where the big picture, and then I'm going to zoom down on, on cyber. 45 years ago, most of you probably remember this. This is the old NASA Control Center when we were launching people in 1969 to the moon. It's absolutely amazing how far we've come in 45 years, but this partnership has always been there between the communications sectors the companies that are inside the sector, the federal government, the state government, and everybody else. We could not have done this. We could have not put somebody on the moon if it had not been for the cooperative spirit of everybody in this ecosystem that today we would call the cyber ecosystem. Back then, the term didn't even exist, but that's exactly what we were doing. Look at all the computers. Now, they're all running Unix. For those of you who are computer nerds, they probably have Bash running, and they don't even know that it's vulnerable. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, don't worry, but a few of you get the joke, right? This is what we think our networks look like today. If somebody asks you, can you draw a network diagram? Show me what the networks look like in the United States. It's, it's a crazy question because if you start drawing it immediately, it's out of date. So in the communications sector, we like to use this model. 
The magical cloud in the middle, you know, we add in some lines and some nodes because people are more comfortable wanting to know what's inside the cloud. And then we say below that is the five different ways we can access the core, and above it is all the services that we provide. That model has seemed to work over the years when we try and describe what are we to people who are looking for lines and things like a highway map or a power grid or, or some other uh, uh, representation. Of course, Verizon is you know, the, the core networking piece, but we have branches and all the little access areas and we provide all the stuff up on top. And so do our competitors. So does Comcast, so does AT&T, so do thousands of other little companies. So we're all one big happy family and we do all have to get along with each other. In order for this to work, we have to cooperate and we have to share information and so far so good. There is an area, though, of telecommunications, this is where I spend a lot of time, that we call National Security and Emergency Preparedness, or NSCP. This has its roots back in the 1960s when we were very, very concerned about the Soviet Union launching a nuclear attack against the United States. Recall the Cuban Missile Crisis in the early 60s and this existential threat we had to our country. President Kennedy recognized that there really this continuity of the government of the United States, the continuity of a constitutional form of government was being threatened and could only be maintained if there was a strong partnership with those who provide communications. The United States is the only country that historically telecom and, and comm in general has been a function of the private sector. If you go all the way back to telegraphy in the 1830s coming forward, only one year, and that was in World War I, when President Wilson nationalized every business in the United States, all the other years, communications has been a private sector endeavor. Compare that to countries that have a ministry of telecommunications or a post telephone and telegraph or something like that where the government ran the comms. Now, in most countries around the world, they've been privatizing, but we, the United States, we're the exception. We've always been doing this independent. So there is a tight role between those who provide communications and those who govern. We have to partner, we have to work together, and that partnership is very strong. Let me just touch on a couple of things that we do high level, some of our priorities. Many of you who are in the first responder community are very familiar with this because it, it absolutely hits home at the local level. We have to have priority, we have to have PSEPs, 911 centers have to work, that connectivity must be there in case of crisis or emergency. We're also looking at new things like the cloud, cyberspace, wireless, mobile, all the new applications that are coming out. How do we integrate that into the old system and the old way of doing things? Smart grid with the intersection with the power, uh, health services as we begin to, to put all of our healthcare records online. All of these roll up into this bigger NSCP type of area. So to make it all work, and I referenced President Kennedy a little while ago, back in 1963, he set forth what's called the National Communications System, or the NCS. That has gone away now as a formal group. It was uh, merged into Homeland Security when DHS was created back in 03, and a couple of years ago, the title NCS has disappeared. The function continues to be there. The private sector piece of this is what we call the National Coordinating Center for Telecommunications. This is where we bring the public and private sectors together, 24 by seven watch operations, this all sits in Washington. Anytime there's anything that happens around the planet, earthquakes, storms, floods, all these natural disasters, civil unrest and uprising, even if a shark bites a cable at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, these guys know about it. And they're coordinating with the private sector, making sure that the impact at the local level is as minimal as possible and bringing in assets and resources as needed. We've got at the presidential level advisory committees, we've got information exchanges that go on between the engineers. Again, this big family of public and private servants working together to make sure that you as an individual can communicate and that you can do whatever your job, function, family life, all of that just kind of happens. And for many of you who work in telecommunications, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. This is our purpose, this is what we do. We enable everybody else uh, to do whatever is in, in their passion. So last thing is at a kind of a new group, this is a sector coordinating council. Department of Homeland Security has recognized that there are 16 sectors across America. These are sectors of the economy as well as uh, uh, critical infrastructure sectors. Communications is one of those. Each of the 16 have sector coordinating councils that are made up of people like myself from the companies that comprise that sector. So our telecommunications sector has a, a fairly well um, established group. We meet quarterly face-to-face, -face. we meet monthly by telephone, 
We meet with our government uh, counterparts at the uh, federal level as well as the state, territorial, and local levels as frequently as their schedules allow. And all of this is for policy planning, making sure that we're all in line with each other. We do risk assessments from time to time. The last one we, com we uh, completed was back in 2012, so two years ago. And I want to highlight the top bullet up there. Any single attack, this is what we've determined by looking at the way we put ourselves together, presents no significant risk to national communications. Why? Because of the resiliency and redundancy of everything that we've been building over the decades. I compare this to what just happened last Friday in Chicago, where there was a single attack against an air traffic control center that even the, today is still disrupting nationwide flights that go through the aviation sector. In comms, if you take out a, a single communication center, we don't have that nationwide disruption. Now, that's, that's a, quite a big claim there, but over the years, this has sort of proven itself out. Now, does that mean that the sun couldn't burp some big mass coronal thingy at us or a meteor hit the planet? Okay, yeah, those are kind of edge cases. We'll, we certainly understand that. But in terms of the normal routine things that we run into from human sabotage to lightning strikes, that's a very, very interesting claim and not too many sectors can make that. So kudos to all of you for having spent your careers and your lives making sure that this all comes together and works. Okay, let me shift now into cyber, now that we've kind of had the big picture of where everything fits together at, at, a, at a federal level. Cyberspace is not new. I mean, the term is new, but the concept of linking people together via some sort of electronic communication system, to be fair, goes back to the 1800s. In fact, a few years ago, somebody published a book called The Victorian Internet, and it was all about how the telegraph was binding societies around the planet together back in the 1880s and 1890s. And in fact, they could do most everything on the on telegraph networks back then that we could do now, except video chat and voice chat, to be fair. But they could move money, they could get married, they could play games. They even had like a telegraph version of Facebook where all the telegraph operators all knew about each other. Absolutely fascinating. Today, we've got this big soup of stuff with all the, the comms companies sort of stuck there in the middle. And then we're surrounded by content providers, edge providers, users, industries, sectors. There's hackers and whackers and terrorists, and we're all just one big happy soup. So how does all this get along with each other? Well, the internet itself, as many of you probably know, doesn't have a central authority. There is no king of the internet. There's no potentate. There's no president. This isn't being run by some large governmental organization. It is, in fact, what people like to call the world's best get-along. We just get along with each other. We interconnect thousands of networks, and there's an app for that, and it works, and it's just absolutely fascinating when you think about it. Unfortunately, though, the heart of the internet, the soul of it, all these autonomous systems that are all glued together, they run on protocols that are based on research done in the 1960s and 70s, predominantly a little bit more in the 1980s. So we're working on top of protocols that are decades old. And were written at a time when our understanding about threats and vulnerabilities was very different from what it is today. The trust model back in the 1970s was that the researchers, those who ran the big mainframes they were connecting together in this old ARPANET and NSFNET back in those days, those researchers all knew each other. They trusted each other. Why would any of them try and do any damage to the internet? In fact, what they didn't trust was the evil phone companies, the ones that had to glue all these computers together. They were not to be trusted. So the basic protocols developed in the 1970s built trust on the edge where the researchers sat and did not trust the network. For those of you who've studied the protocols, TCP IP assumes the network won't work. <clears throat> and we're going to find ways to get around a crunchy network. We do, however, trust the edge. Well, now it's 2014. What is the edge of today's internet? Yeah, almost three billion souls. How many of them can trust each other like the hundreds or thousands of researchers that all knew each other back in the 70s and 80s? But the soul of the internet still believes the edge is trustworthy and the core is not. So we have an inverted trust model. And this is fundamentally one of the problems with today's internet, today's internet security, is because of that old, old trust model. So we, communicators, we understand that everything that we've been building 
now depends on this new emerging thing called the internet. Actually, it's not new. The term's been in use now for several decades. But we've been moving everything over. We have everything over IP, voice over IP, video over IP, everything over IP. And it used to be that what we used to worry about as communicators was all physical. We'd worry about the fiber seeking backhoe, or we worried about the lightning strike, or we worried about some truck backing into a central office and causing equipment to fall over. Today, we worry about virtual attacks, supply chain attacks, human actors. We can protect ourselves against the big hurricane that's coming against the Gulf Coast of the United States, but the hurricane doesn't figure out what we've done and then adjusts the direction that it shoots at us. A hacker, on the other hand, if we go in and we start doing all sorts of things in cyberspace, the hackers learn and they'll adjust and they'll start coming at us from a different direction. You see the difference there? That is a big insight because we base so much of our knowledge on countering physical threats that don't adjust or change their mind if we get better at protecting ourselves, but now we're up against a thinking opponent that can. Those are different rules. That's very, very hard. So if you look at where we are today, some 40-ish years after the invention of TCP IP and the launch of all these networks, we are really running this big, huge experiment as though it's no longer an experiment. Again, in its soul, it still thinks it is. The training wheels are still on the Harley. We, we gotta knock them off and, and drive this thing like it's, like it's a real machine. The real world has intersected with the internet and the real world has brought with it a bunch of junk. And that's what I'm gonna to start to show you is what does it mean when the real world intersects this hypothetical, pretty little pristine experiment that was being run by a few hundred people who trusted each other. Is everybody up to speed with me now where we are? Okay, so, and by the way, how many trillions of dollars are passing through this network right now? As we're sitting here speaking and we blindly trust it, I'm gonna make all of you not wanna get online by the time we get telling lunch today, right? We used to be worried about all this stuff here at the bottom. That was our biggest problem up to a couple of decades ago. It was all about natural disruptions. Yeah, we had some fraud going on. Every now and then somebody would try and you know, force a phone call from a pay station without putting their dime into it. But really, our biggest problem was physical. Today, now we start looking at all these other things, all the way up to nation states that want to do battle against each other across our networks. Well, folks, I didn't build my network to be a battlefield. But yet, we've got our own country and many other countries that look on our networks as their future battlefield. And we're sort of insulted. It's like, that's not your battlefield. Go build your own somewhere. Of course, they come back and say, yeah, well, we invented this. This was an army experiment back in the 60s, so we get to fight on it. They, you know, and round and round and round we go. Of course, the criminals, the spies, the terrorists, the insiders, oh, they just love this. And then you have those old teenage hackers that can't wait to get in and cause damage. All of these are thinking opponents. Again, they're not like natural stuff. So let's look at a few of these groups. The terrorist groups have largely left the internet, internet alone, thank goodness. I mean, there was a lot of concern after September 11th that groups like Al-Qaeda, or today we would say groups like ISIS, would actually get onto the internet and cause terrorism. Not really quite sure how that would play out, because if they began to terrorize the internet, the internet would become unusable, and then they wouldn't be able to continue any terrorism. So what we have found is most terrorist groups like to use the internet as a place to make money, just like a criminal group. They do run these phishing campaigns, the spam stuff. A lot of the garbage that you see in your inbox is not just coming from crime groups, but coming from terrorist groups. And that's sort of scary when you think about that, that you're actually looking at stuff coming from well-known terrorist groups. We've had some edge cases like this gang out of Iraq, or excuse me, out of Iran that's been messing with our banks here in the United States doing denial of service attacks, all in the name of Iran and their kind of crazy mindset. We also see the criminals. This is probably the overwhelming amount of badness that's online today. The criminal community has always understood how to stay one step or two steps in front of the law. When the internet came along, this created almost like a perfect place for crime. Just anything that you want to do, you can get away with online. Remember the old New Yorker uh, cartoon about nobody knows I'm a dog when I'm on, on the internet? Nobody knows I'm a criminal. Nobody knows I'm a terrorist. I can just get out there and do things. There is so much value out there, so much to be stolen. In fact, the few people that are arrested, their number one complaint is that companies like mine don't provide a big enough pipe for them to steal everything. It's like Verizon, can't you make your networks faster? There's so much we could be able to steal if you just speed up my connection. 
that's really all they complain about. So yeah, I guess that's a good thing <laughs> from our perspective. Uh, maybe we should sell more, more wireless or, or to, the, to the criminal gangs. Look at the values here. Do you remember back to your economics classes in high school, supply and demand? So what does the value of something do if there's not a lot of supply? Does its cost go up or down? If there's not a lot of something, in other words, it's, so the, yeah, costs go up. What if there's a high demand for something? What does its cost do? It also goes up. So you remember you had the equilibrium curves, you know, where supply and demand meet each other for some price point. That's called equilibrium. Well, we can do the same sort of modeling against the criminal community, and it's scary, that bottom thing down there, online today, I can get PayPal accounts with a login and a password for about two bucks per account. What does that tell me about the supply side? Yeah, millions of them out there just for the taking. Credit cards um, with the security code and expiration date, $4 per card. Amazing. These values are so low because there's so much of it. You can't tell me there's very little demand. There's high demand for this. But the, the amount is, is just overwhelming. You can see the other numbers that are on there. We're also up against the counterfeiting world. Not just those that work online stealing stuff from you, but those who can't get enough of everything that's online, they're going to go off and manufacture their own credit cards. This is from Montgomery County, Maryland, a recent bust. You can see the credit card making machine. They go online, steal your credentials, get it from your accounts, and then just burn that information into a card. Then they can go walk into Target, Walmart, Home Depot, whatever, and just use that card, charge things up. Who ultimately has to pay for all of this, these fraudulent charges? Do you pay for it as the card owner? No, of course not. Does the bank pay for it? No, it's the merchant that pays for it. So if Walmart authorizes the charge, you go in and say, that really wasn't me. Visa, MasterCard, Discover, whatever will back charge Walmart. Walmart gets stuck with it. What does that do to your consumer prices? So in the end, you pay, but it's not like you're left holding the big bag. Unfortunately, the banks make money in both directions. There's the charge for the use of the card. There's the charge to reverse the charges. Yeah, that's a dirty little secret in financial services and something that we're going to kind of have to come to grips with. Well, counterfeiting doesn't just stop with credit cards. We find counterfeit components. Here's an electrolytic capacitor. We crack the case open, and you can see that what's inside it doesn't match what's on the outside. Could this be a problem, potentially? What if it was for some critical, uh, critical switch? We also run into now, come back, there we go. Come on back. We can do it. There we go. Fake applications, and these are showing up on cell phones, mobile phones being manufactured in Asia. If you go online, you can usually find an iPhone online at a, a tenth or less the price of buying it at an Apple store. You can find Samsungs and Androids and all the other ones, same thing, much, much less. Why are you getting them less? It's probably because they're counterfeit, and when they arrive, they come even equipped with counterfeit applications designed to steal your information. Very, very shameful. The other piece I want to point out, this is kind of where this slide comes from. Imagine when we leave today and you walk outside of your hotel room. You're going to go a nice walk. It's a beautiful sunny day outside. You're going to stretch your legs a little bit. And laying there on the sidewalk is a pack of chewing gum and a USB thumb drive. Everybody knows what a thumb drive is? This little, here's one in my pocket right here. This little stick, you pop it open. So you see that thing laying on the sidewalk and you see the gum. What are you going to do? What's your reaction? Do you keep on walking? How many of you are going to pick up the gum, open it up, pull a stick out, enjoy a stick of chewing gum as you walk down the sidewalk? Oh, yeah, get this look on your face like, oh, that's gross. Okay, those same people, will you pick up the USB key and throw it in your pocket and then walk back to your hotel room or walk to your office, plug it out and shove it into the next computer you find? What's the difference? What is the difference between shoving a piece of gum in your mouth and shoving an unknown USB key into some computer? Is there a difference? I mean, the USB key is looking for an orifice, right? It's just, the only way it works is if you shove it into some. Now, are you going to shove it into your home computer? Oh, no way. But I'll put it into my one at work. Yeah, because somebody else is going to protect that one. It's a social custom, folks. And this is what's getting us in trouble. We don't even start with basic education of our children. We teach our children, don't pick up that chewing gum. You don't know where it's been. But how many of you tell your children not to pick up a USB key? 
don't pick up that CD or DVD. And I'm not trying to say anything bad about the folks that have their booths set up out there. <laughs> But I'll guarantee you a few of them are trying to give you something to take home that you're going to have to shove into your computer when you get home. And I know they're all legit, but boy, I sure get worried. Anytime somebody hands me a piece of media and says, here you go. You know, and like you guys back here in the back, when I loaded this presentation up, I'm just thinking, yeah, I own you, don't I? Because I'm shoving that thing right into your laptop. No, I wouldn't do that to anybody. But there have been cases where security conferences, people come in with infected USB keys, put them into the presentation machine, and every other USB key after they get gets the virus or the worm or whatever put onto the key, which then goes back and it spreads itself just like a childhood disease in some kindergarten class. So this is really what we've created, this ecosystem really is a lot like people. So why is it so hard? I mean, it is all man-made. Why can't we just turn it off or turn off the insecurity, just take a magic eraser out there and make it disappear. It ought to be easy, right? Well, it turns out there's so much difficulty. If it was easy, we would have done it years ago. We have a hyper complex technical problem here. Most of us don't begin to understand how it all works. We just buy things at Best Buy or Walmart or wherever. We plug it in and it's amazing that it all comes together. But behind the scenes, the geeks and the wizards and the policy makers what we're over and over increasingly finding is we don't speak the same language. We don't have a taxonomy. If you're in the a classic other world, say, of medical, real estate, engineering, all the old professions, there are absolutely clear, laid down, precise words that mean things. And we teach this year after year, generation after generation. Unfortunately, in cyber, we disagree on what terms mean. We don't have commonality, much less being able to teach it at the university level. So we're going to have to solve that. That's almost like challenge number one. How do we figure out what words we use in order to move forward? Of course, the technologies are very different. And where it really kicks us is the law. Virtually none of current public law addresses technology at a level that it needs to. And we're very scared properly to put anything into law for fear that technology is going to change. That, that's a very rational fear. But it also means that older laws, for example, the ECPA, that's the Communications Privacy Act from back in the late 80s, it restricts a company like mine from being able to lawfully share information about a cyber threat. For example, if one of my customers has an intruder coming in, we're providing circuits to them, and they've paid us to monitor and you know, take care of that circuit, we can tell the customer, hey, bad guys are trying to get into your network, we're blocking them for you, you need to make sure you patch, blah, 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 because we can see this is what they're going after. Customer says, great. We can't turn over to Homeland Security or FBI or somebody else and say, hey, by the way, we need you all to know there's this bad actor out there going after one of our customers. We cannot do that under, under the Privacy Act. That old law written back in the 1980s didn't anticipate the problems we're getting into today. Our customer can talk to law enforcement all day long. We just can't do it on behalf of them. So it's little things like that that we're going to have to address going forward. Policies, mostly at the national level, and we do work with Department of Justice and others, but our Congress, and we'll talk about the Congress here in just a moment, seems to be somewhat deadlocked, <laughs> and it's hard to move things forward. Yeah, speaking of good old, oops, I keep hitting that button twice, and it goes forward. So good old Congress. They've been trying for a number of years to fix the security problem. They've been wanting to do comprehensive cybersecurity legislation. Many of you probably recall the Senator Rockefeller bill from a number of years ago that had the kill switch, if you remember that. In the tech community, we all started buying these uh, easy buttons from, um, what's the, is it Staples or, yeah, that has, you know what I'm talking about, right? And we were joking that that's what the president would have on his desk, and if you need to turn off the internet, just slap the easy button and the internet stops. Yeah, that's how crazy it had become. Today, where we're sitting in, in September of 2014, the Senate and the House both have bills that they've, they've got ready to go. They are not completely compatible with each other. They focus on information sharing. They're not mandates. There's nothing in there about requiring people to apply patches at a certain time. But as you know, the Congress right now is worried about a lot of other things, much less their re-election that's coming up in November. The only real opportunity is what they call the lame duck session. This will happen after the November elections. But immigration reform, what to do about ISIS, what to do about uh, finances, you know, the funding the government, all these things are far more important than cyber. So odds are pretty good that this will just go past this year and we'll have to start it again next year. Last year's Snowden revelations didn't help at all. 
because that made it look like the whole reason we're doing cybersecurity is for surveillance purposes. They were trying to make it more uh, powerful for the NSA and others to go out and read your email. That's not why we're doing cyber. But the press and the public got very confused with this. So the White House has been frustrated just as much as we have in, in the private sector. And they, last year, after the end of the previous congressional session with no action, put forth an executive order along with a presidential policy directive that tried to address these problems. They build this as a down payment. In other words, the White House can't do legislation, but they can put forth executive branch guidance. So just real quickly from a, a policy perspective, um, an executive order can talk to the executive branch only. In other words, if the president signs an EO, it can't direct you or me as a citizen to do something, only departments and agencies. So inside this executive order that came out back last year, one of the key things is this top bullet about developing a neutral framework. And we'll talk about this in a moment. This is the NIST cybersecurity framework. It also asked it to incentivize practices, to ramp up the information sharing. And notice the last thing here at the bottom, explore the use of existing regulation. The White House is not saying produce more regulation. What they're saying is, given the current regulatory environment, is there anything we can do to promote or incentivize better security practices? But please don't go off and write new regulations. This has been somewhat confusing, as you can imagine, because most regulators would love to say, oh, there's my permission to start writing more rules and more orders. We really think this is something that we, we're going to have to take it slowly as we move forward. The NIST framework is probably the, the biggest deal that's happened in quite a while. Everybody's familiar with NIST, that, that's um, Science and Technology or Standards and Technology Group. They're really good at developing crypto, fire standards, steel standards, all kind of other neat things. So throughout last year, we had a number of organizations working together um, through workshops, over 500 attendees across five different workshops, to come up with what is the right way ahead for a critical infrastructure owner operator, as well as a small business, large businesses, even individuals. If you want to get serious about cybersecurity risk management, how do you do it? And we developed a fairly straightforward plan. We have already decided to have a follow-on workshop this year to kind of take a look at how well does, are we doing and do we need a framework 2.0, something that we'll work on next year if we decide that such a thing is necessary. Yeah, this thing bounces on me. Inside the framework, there's five basic areas. And this is risk management 101. We identify, we protect, we detect, we respond and recover. Doesn't that sound like just regular risk management? The only difference is we've applied cyber to it. So what it looks like on the inside, this is just an example. We'll have something like, say, in the identify under the subcategory of risk assessments. Here are pointers to current ISO standards, NIST standards, and other things. So all we've done here is just taken the family of existing standards, procedures, and practices and sorted them almost into an encyclopedia. So if you don't know where to start, start on page one and begin reading. This also had a companion document going towards senior leaders, boards of directors, and others, showing them how they can use this framework inside their organization. The beautiful thing here is it applies from small businesses all the way to large businesses. So if you're not familiar with it, I would highly encourage to take a look at the framework, read those executive summaries. And I'm really sorry, this keeps flipping on me. The government also wanted to have all of us make some statement of adoption. In other words, go out and, and, and say that you're adopting the framework. There's pros and cons to this. As we, a private company, have been looking into it, anytime we make a claim of any sort, nation's largest, you know, biggest provider, or whatever marketing terms we use, we have to be extremely careful to make sure that our claim is something we can support, else we get sued. So if we make a claim of having adopted something, the lawyers will tell you that's a massive exposure. Because once you claim adoption, somebody's going to try, come in and try and figure out, well, you're not doing exactly this little thing. And then off you go to court for some kind of lawsuit. It's an unfortunate world that we live in with all the litigation. But what's happened is that many companies will never issue a statement that they've adopted. But we do say that we are using the framework. We have built it into our procedures, you know, whatever the proper legal terms are. Bottom line, though, is that we have found that across the communications sector, yeah, for all practical purposes, we are well beyond the framework. We were well involved last year with the development of it, and I can happily say that we are probably what we could call a, a pre-adopter. 
In terms of state, local, small organizations, Homeland Security recognized early last year that many people don't have the funding, uh, and it's, it's a tight budget world, to try and get adoption and promotion of this new framework going. So Homeland has made available through the state and local efforts funding for your, yourself and for others if you want to implement or start be to begin to use the framework. The place to go to find out about all this is over at Homeland or uh, US CERT and go to what they call C cubed VP. Okay, what does all that stand for? So they have created what they call the Critical Infrastructure Cyber Community. That's the C3 part voluntary program. That's the VP. It's all free and they've got a ton of stuff that they're giving away. They will come out and educate you. They'll do seminars. They'll show up at presentations. They have online training. All this available virtually to anybody. So I would encourage you, if you want to get started on the framework, don't know where to start, this is probably the best place. And let them work with you. So let me start wrapping this up and maybe take a question or two if I can get the slides to move forward. I'm sure that it'll, there we go. With the last item I wanted to mention, and this is also a, a pub, kind of like the epitome of public-private partnering. How many of you are familiar with Verizon's breach report? Some of you? So we have a forensics team, a data forensics team, that over the years has been called in to look at data breaches. Think about what happened to Target last year or this ongoing thing with Home Depot and many others. A few years into doing the data breaches, we realized, you know, we're sitting on top of some information here that nobody else has seen. We're beginning to see patterns. We're beginning to understand how the bad guys are getting in. So we published a report, and we did it with the Secret Service. It was Verizon Secret Service working together. That had so much success that in the years have gone by, we're up to seven reports now, we now have close to 100 organizations that we're working with, over 10 years' worth of data, and in the report that's out and is freely available, you can just download the PDF. What we've done now is instead of just trying to say, here's how the bad guys in for, got in through these different types of avenues, what we've uncovered is if we take the slices of the economy, of which the public sector is one slice, and there's several others, and we compare them across all the different types of breaches, there are nine very distinct patterns that begin to emerge. In other words, how the bad guys get in. And in any particular sector, like if we just take the public sector, of those nine, three of them cover over half of the way the bad guys get in. Now, those three vary between the different sectors. So there'll be three different ways for financial services, three different ones for communications, three different ones for chemical, electric power. That's absolutely fascinating because it means two things. Number one is that the sectors are building their defenses slightly differently. And number two is that the attack community is being selective in who they're going after. They're using different techniques depending on how they're targeting. We had always thought that the attackers use the same techniques against everybody. Now what we're finding is that is not the fact. So I would encourage you to download the report. It's written in a, in a kind of a fun language. It's not techno geeky, it's, it's an easy read. But look in there and you can begin to learn exactly how our adversaries are behaving and this is all coming from the machines. It's the computers telling us by analyzing the logs. The machines are saying, here's what's going on. It's not a survey of 100 chief information security officers asking them about what, come on here, clicker, there we go, about how they lose sleep. We often get worried about the, the human side of cyber, but I always have to point out there still is that physical thing. This was a flood in Colorado late last year. You can see the railroad tracks survived, but our fiber optic cables kind of broke in half there. Is that a cyber attack? Well, we definitely, it's, it's an availability problem. We definitely lost that circuit. And it took a little while to negotiate with the railroad. How do we get out there? Literally, we got some Verizon guys and some railroad guys on one of those little cars you know, where you're, you're <laughs> pumping it. As you, and that's how they got out here to take this picture. And they come up to it, they hit the brakes. And it's like, okay, Joe, are you going to go across on the other side of those tracks with this little pumper thing? No. How about Jim wants you to do it? <laughs> no. So they climbed down in. Anyway, it took a few weeks, as you can imagine. Imagine also the problem of how do you release those railroad tracks? You know, if you cut the steel on this side, it's going to go as it tries to go to the other side. Um, for us, repairing fiber optic cable is a whole lot easier than the poor old railroad trying to rebuild those railroad tracks. But you can see that intersection there. 
Tomorrow, folks, is the launch of National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. It's October of each year. We've been doing it. This is our 11th year now. A big public-private partnership. Eventually, we'll get it to stay put without clicking forward. Go to staysafeonline.org. That's where all the details are. There's a ton of information you can use to train yourself, your organizations, those people that are around you. There are webinars, Twitter chats, videos, lots and lots of things that are there. And this all starts tomorrow. In fact, this afternoon, I'm flying down to Nashville. We're going to kick this off at the NASIO conference there uh, in the music city of Nashville. Should be a lot of fun. So I'm out of time and out of words. I think I've, oh, wow, I've got three minutes. <laughs> Is there anybody who has a question? I'd love to answer a question or two. Or have we given you full indigestion? Yes, ma'am. There sure are. Again, if you go to Stay Safe Online, they've got links to all those types of PSAs. Homeland Security has them as well at uscert.gov. Uh, your, your discussion of the way the Internet developed was fascinating to me, and the trust on the outside and the distrust on the inside. Mm -hmm. If you were to build a network from scratch today, and I'm thinking kind of like FirstNet, what would you be thinking about in terms of... Yeah, in the military, we used to say this. Okay, so the question was, if I'm looking at the old internet and it's kind of crunchy in the middle because we didn't trust the networks, but I want to build something brand new, you know, what lesson can I live on? What's brand new? FirstNet, well in the military we'd say that because it's right in front of your nose, right? Are we building FirstNet as a brand new greenfield network? No. How about Smart Grid? A whole other independent effort. No. How about the healthcare networks? No. How about the Internet of Things? No. We got a problem, folks? Huge problem. We have all these opportunities as a country to look at the last 40 years of doing this thing called the Internet and saying, okay, what works, what doesn't work, how do we improve? And every time something new comes along, this big opportunity to do something right, what do we do? Let's just go back and put another coat of paint on what we currently have and call it something new. I'm sorry, folks, we've got to stop doing that. We've got to be able to leverage these new ideas, these opportunities for change, and start changing. Now, does that mean we throw out what's all, what's all there? Of course not. This thing called the internet will be there forever. TCP IP as a protocol will be as baked in as 110 volt 60 cycles. It's in these little outlets everywhere. It's standard, it's been around for over 100 years, it's going nowhere. We have to, though, learn and build upon and not try and just repeat these same mistakes because, for example, with FirstNet, it is an awesome idea, but we run the danger of building into FirstNet the same insecurities that are currently existing everywhere else. What a huge opportunity to use this thing called building security, I'll get to you in just a second, and try and build that in as we move forward with our first responders, building a very, very critical network for them to build on top of. Yes, sir? But it's cheaper for us, It certainly is cheaper. And then we come back four years later whining and crying because all we did was put a coat of paint on it. And I'm not suggesting that this means we spend billions on a brand new infrastructure. We can build on what we have, but we have to build smart and think security just as much as we were thinking safety in an earlier era when we were worried about the physical types of damage that are out there. Any other questions? Folks, I appreciate your attention. Thanks so much for coming to Minnesota and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thanks so much. <laughs>